Thank you so much, Kendra. Good morning, everybody. And Kendra, can you just <clears throat> let me know that my slides look okay? It looks great. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, again, thank you for that introduction. Good morning to everyone who is here today. I am very glad to be here to be talking to um, such an important part of our workforce who does such important work. And um, to be talking about this, this topic, portion distortion, <clears throat> I was very happy to understand that there was an interest in this topic, which is something that um, we're all affected by to some degree. And I'll talk about why in a few minutes. So thank you for being here. And I look forward to the webinar today and to um, <clears throat> talking to you about this topic and to answering any questions that you may have at the end. Um, so I'll get started. Before I get started with our topic for today, I wanted to just take a couple minutes to tell you briefly about um, Rutgers Cooperative Extension, which is where I work. So you know where I'm coming from, what Cooperative Extension um, is and what we do. So uh, Cooperative Extension actually is a national system. There is uh, one Cooperative Extension or sometimes two um, in every state. Cooperative extensions are run out of the land-grant university in every state. So in New Jersey, that happens to be Rutgers. <clears throat> we are over 100 years old. We've been around for a long time. Um, we have a long um, and very interesting history, but uh, very briefly, I'll tell you why we exist and what we do. Um, so a little over 100 years ago, um, there was a you know, group of very smart people that realized that there is um, all this really wonderful stuff happening at universities around the country. So there's research and there's resources and there's information, um, but there really wasn't a reliable way for all of this stuff to get to the people, to the community. So Cooperative Extension was established um, to do that, to be like that bridge between the university and the community so that the, um, the people had access to information in agriculture and natural resources, youth development and um, health and nutrition. So, Within Cooperative Extension, there are three main departments. You'll see them listed on your screen there under the red writing. The first you'll see is Agriculture and Natural Resources. So that department works with the farming community to bring them the latest in research and information to ensure that our um, sources of agriculture are uh, using the most up-to-date information and, and technology that they um, that is available. They also work with home gardeners. Um, then the second department is 4-H youth development. I think that's probably uh, the most well-known. Um, so I think most, if not all of you here, have probably heard of 4-H. Maybe you've been to one of the county fairs that they run. Um, and they run a really uh, a number of really wonderful um, programs and education in the area of youth development. And finally, last but not least, there's my department, which is family and community health sciences. Uh, my department um, does education and programming in the areas of health, nutrition, and wellness. We are a county-based system. So we have, in New Jersey, there's 21 counties. We have uh, currently 20 county offices with faculty and staff from all three of those departments in every county. And so the faculty and staff in our cooperative extension offices are there to serve the county in which they are located. <clears throat> Um, the great thing about working with Cooperative Extension is that you can feel confident that you are getting uh, information that is evidence-based, research-based information and programming. Um, and we are here to serve the community um, on behalf of Rutgers as a service on behalf of Rutgers. So most of the programming that we offer <clears throat> is available at no cost or sometimes you know, at a minimal cost, depending on what services you're accessing. Um, so that is a Cooperative Extension in a nutshell. I just wanted to uh, make that known so everybody here understands who we are and where I work and, and um, what we do. So, so thank you for listening to that for a couple minutes. I am now going to get into the topic for today and why you came um, to learn about portion distortion. So let's start at the beginning. Portion distortion, what is it? <clears throat> so the definition, portion distortion is the tendency to consume larger quantities of food and drink than is necessary to maintain good health. Portion distortion has become increasingly common over the last few decades, and I'll talk a little bit about why, but I wanted to just give this definition so that we're all on the same page, we all understand what portion distortion is. Um, and it really is a distortion of the understanding of how much our bodies need to eat and drink in order to stay healthy, to maintain good health. When we're talking about portion distortion, I want to make the distinction between a serving versus a portion. So let's look at that. 
So a serving is the amount of food that you see listed on the nutrition facts label. So that is that little black and white label that is on um, packaged foods that you see in any grocery store, um, any convenience store. So when you turn it around, you'll see that little black and white uh, label. <clears throat> and on there, you'll see a serving. Okay, it could say one cup or it could say, you know, one bar, depending on what, what food it is. So a serving is the amount that you see listed on the nutrition facts label. A portion, on the other hand, is the amount of food that people choose to put on their plates or consume. So that means that a portion <clears throat> may actually contain several servings. What I mean by that is if the serving that's listed on the nutrition facts label is half a cup of, let's say, you know, popcorn, use the example that we have there, um, and but you put in your bowl one cup of popcorn, that is actually two servings. Your portion is one cup, your servings are two. Hope that makes sense, but we'll, get, we'll look at another example. So cereal. So if you look on the back of a cereal box, you will see listed at the very top of the nutrition facts label what the serving size is. And that may be one cup, it may be different, but for this example, we'll use, we'll use one cup as our example. So when you pour one cup of cereal into your bowl, that is one serving. But how much you actually put into the bowl may be more than that. It might be two cups, it might be two and a half cups. So your portion size may differ from the serving size that is listed on the nutrition facts label. So why, why are we even talking about this? What's the problem? Why are we concerned about portion distortion? Why are we here today talking about this? So um, an increase of just 100 calories a day when compounded over the course of a year can result in a 14 pound weight gain if not balanced out with exercise. Um, and research has shown what, that when people are served bigger portions, they eat more and don't compensate for the extra calories by eating less or increasing physical activity later in the day. And like I mentioned in the beginning, we are seeing portion distortion. I mean, portion distortion is just the norm now. Um, it's very common. <clears throat> so when we're looking at just 100 calories um, and we look at the portion size that we're giving ourselves compared to the serving size, that may be more than an extra 100 calories, could be an extra 200 calories or more depending on the food and how many servings are in the portion that you are that you are um, consuming. So to give you an idea of what 100 calories looks like, I thought it would be helpful to just look at some examples. Okay, so um, 100 calories is about one banana, 24 grapes, one and a half nectarines, four carrots, seven slices of cucumber. It's not a lot in other words. So I, I wanted to make this distinction because um, you know, when we're serving ourselves several servings in our portions, just 100 calories or more can actually make a big difference, okay? And it may not look like much, but it could be several hundred calories, okay? So why do we care? Why do we care that this is happening? Um, I'm sure that, you know, all everybody here works in the in the the um the healthcare workforce in some capacity or or another. So I'm sure that you are familiar with some of these statistics to some degree. But the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, <clears throat> the CDC, estimates that the rate of adults who are overweight in this country is um, over 70% right now. And the obesity rate is getting up towards about 40%, 37.9%. Um, and we're not seeing that leveling off or decreasing. We're seeing that remaining steady and also increasing. The current percentage of adolescents, age 12 to 19 years, um, obesity rate is 20.6. Um, and these numbers are much higher than we've ever seen before in the past. Um, before really like the, the, the early to mid 1970s, we were not seeing any significant portion of adolescents and children um, who were um, categorized as being obese. And we're seeing it younger and younger too. <clears throat> the percentage of children aged six to 11 years who have been categorized in the obese category is now 17.4%. And we see this percentage increase as you can see um, as children age. So in the six to 11 years, I'll put my other uh, bullet point up here. Between two and five years, we see the rate at about 9%. Then as they get older, the rate increases to about 17%, then 20, and then adults were going up towards 40%. Um, so we wanna start, you know, try to um, instill healthy habits in our kids from an early age that will increase their chances of maintaining a healthy weight for the long-term throughout their lifespans. So where are we finding portion distortion today? Where are we finding these bigger portion sizes? We're seeing it basically everywhere. We're surrounded with uh, this, this, um, 
this phenomenon of portion distortion pretty much, pretty much everywhere we go. We're seeing it in restaurants. We're seeing it in grocery stores. We're also seeing it in our own kitchens and dining rooms. Um, we are constantly being bombarded with this idea of like eating more. You know, you can eat more and be healthy, indulge. Um, we're just surrounded by food, like, you know, more than we ever have been before. We, we really are living in um, a very unique time in history. You know, throughout history, the, the history of, of humans, until recently, it has always been um, a struggle to figure out, okay, well, how are we going to make sure that everybody in the world, you know, the population has enough to eat? Um, we are faced with, you know, a, a different type of problem today, at least where we live, at least in this country where we are, you know, a, a resource rich country in this part of the country as well. We're surrounded by food constantly. You can't go to pretty much any store without there being some sort of snack nearby, right? You go to Home Depot or a pharmacy or pretty much anywhere and there are snacks by the checkout. So we're now surrounded by food, which is a, an, an issue that never used to exist before. Um, so, you know, our research shows that our environment has a much, much more uh, significant impact on our health behaviors than uh, knowledge, for example, than anything else. So the fact that our environment has changed and is now, um, you know, we're surrounded with food and larger portions everywhere, um, that means that um, it has now become the norm and people are going to be, um, you know, eating more calories than necessary to maintain a healthy weight and to maintain good health overall. Um, so in restaurants, bigger portions and more food equates with value, right? So um, restaurants are constantly competing for business. They want you to eat at their restaurant. So they're going to constantly be offering larger portions for less money um, to get your business and to get you to eat there. Um, grocery stores, okay, serving sizes have grown on average um, 46% since 1980 on 65% of edible food items in a grocery store. And again, it's the economy of scale, more bang for your buck. If you know that you are going to go to a restaurant and get you know, a huge portion for a, a, you know, a small amount of money, to you, that's a good value, right? We are used to these gigantic portions. This is a, just a little anecdotal um, story of, of my own, but I think it's, it's an interesting one. I, several years ago, studied abroad in, in Mexico. And, um, the uh, the small city that I was in, you know, we went to the local restaurants frequently, and um, the portions were definitely smaller than what they serve here in restaurants. Um, and I got used to that, and it was enough. It was it wasn't. I have never left hungry. It was definitely enough, um, but not these gigantic portions that we tend to see in restaurants today that we have got now gotten accustomed to. And then after I'd been there for several weeks, you know, a few months uh, or so. Um, I took a trip with a few of my, my classmates to a larger city nearby and they had a, a, like a typical sort of like American style mall there and there was a Chili's and I hadn't been to an American restaurant since I had, you know, uh, arrived there from home. And so I, uh, convinced my, my classmates, let's go to Chili's, you know, I haven't been there, you know, to an American restaurant in, in months now, you know? So anyway, so I sat, you know, we, we sat down, we ordered and I ordered a chicken Caesar salad. And um, I'm sure it's distorted now in my mind, but I have this image of the server coming over to our table with this like platter. Looked like he was like carrying it like this in front of him and he put it down in front of me and it looked just gigantic. Um, and um, I couldn't finish like even a quarter of it because I, I just had gotten used to the much smaller, more appropriate portion sizes, uh, serving sizes that were being served in the, the restaurants um, in the smaller city that I had been in. So it was just an interesting observation for me. And I still think about that to this day when I'm talking about um, this topic of portion distortion. Um, but American restaurants, yeah, we have gotten used to these gigantic portions um, that just leave you feeling really overfull. So um, same thing in grocery stores. We are seeing just, you know, larger uh, uh, sizes of everything, larger bags of chips, larger because, you know, the economy of scale. If you get more for your money, you're more likely to buy that product. And um, stores are constantly, stores and food companies are constantly competing for our business. We also are seeing this at home. So dinner plates today are larger than ever. Um, there, uh, right now, uh, the average dinner plate is between 10 and 12 inches in diameter. In 1980, they were eight inches. That's a, at least, a, you know, it's a two to four inch difference just in the diameter. So um, psycho psychologically, when you have a plate in front of you, you fill it up. That's just what we do. That's a sort of a, a staple of our health behaviors when we're, we're 
like serving ourselves dinner or lunch, whatever, on a, on a bowl or a plate, we fill it up. So if we have an eight inch plate in front of us, we fill that up. But then if we have a 12 inch plate in front of us, we also fill it up. So that, you know, four inch diameter difference, that's a significant difference. So that means we're just giving ourselves more food without even under, like realizing, you know, without being intentional about it. So I want to show you some examples of um, portion distortion that we see um, very, you know, uh, uh, commonly um, around us. So first of all, a bagel. 20, 30 years ago, a bagel was about three inches in diameter. Um, if you have ever gone into your local bagel store, I'm assuming, you know, we're, this, we're in New Jersey, so I assume that everyone has been to, uh, you know, a small local bagel store at some point in your lives. Um, if you ever have ordered a mini bagel, that used to be just a bagel. <laughs> um, but now um, our bagels have just increased to twice the size. The average bagel now is six inches in diameter. Um, so that's a difference of uh, more than 200 calories right there, just, just in one bagel. And it's not where, it, this is where the distortion part comes in because now we are used to these gigantic six inch, big fluffy bagels, which are delicious, right? We all, who doesn't love a good bagel, a good fresh bagel. Um, but it's not where we are even aware that we are eating more than maybe we, we used to several years ago or more than we intend to. That is now a normal serving or portion to us, right? Um, and so then it's not just the bagel, but then there's, you know, um, added butter or cream cheese or uh, Taylor, ha I, I'm from Taylor ham country, maybe you're from pork roll country, um, Taylor ham or pork roll and the, the, you know, the egg and the cheese, there's more of everything on there. So it's not just the extra calories in the bagel, it's extra from whatever goes on top as well. Um, and again, this is what we're used to. I think that if you went into a bagel store today and you ordered a bagel and they gave you a little three inch bagel, you might feel like um, you were cheated a little bit, <laughs> right? Like this isn't, this isn't a bagel, this is a tiny thing. Um, when in reality, that's what bagels used to look like for many, many years. Right. Cheeseburgers. 20 years ago, cheeseburgers used to be about, mm, you know, two to three ounces of meat. Uh, 333 calories at like a you know your typical like fast food restaurant or, or a diner somewhere. Um, today they're twice the size again, 590 calories, and that's a difference of a 257 calories. If you remember earlier on, I mentioned that um, a difference of 100 calories, just 100 compounded over the course of a year, can result in a significant weight gain, weight gain maybe you know 14 pounds or more over the course of a year. So these are differences that are uh, not just 100 calories. We're seeing 200, 300 calorie differences um, where we might not even realize or be intentionally eating larger portions. It's just that what is served to us is what we eat. Soda. Um, so you may be aware that you know sugar sweetened beverages are um, yeah, the, the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages has risen over like 130 percent since the 1970s. Um, Sugar sweetened beverages are also the number one source of added sugars in our diet. Now, 20, 30 years ago, you may have been able to find like a six, six and a half ounce soda in a store. I don't even see those anymore. When you walk into like, you know, a convenience store um, and they have those you know, refrigerators lining the, the perimeter of the store with all these different, you know, varieties, dozens and dozens of varieties of beverages, sodas and other soft drinks. Um, I don't even see cans anymore. I just see that the 20 ounce is like the normal size. Again, portion distortion comes into play here because that is what we're used to. That's what we want now. That's what we expect to see in these stores. Um, whereas years ago, you could get like a six and a half ounce soda, 85 calories. Okay. Um, today, um, the norm is the 20 ounces, more like 250 calories, difference of 165 calories. And that's just one drink. Right? Maybe if you have more of these in a day, that's going to be you know twice that number of extra calories. Sandwiches. Okay, twenty years ago, we used to see sandwiches on you know maybe whole wheat bread or white bread, whatever whatever that is there, normal size sandwich bread, um, which is about three hundred and twenty calories. Um, today, it's harder and harder to get sandwiches of that that size, um, and it's more common to see something like you see on the right, um, which is a, a much larger portion. 
um, and is likely to be more like 820 calories with the big fluffy bread and piling it on with the, you know, with the, the, the meats and the cheeses and the sauces. And so that really adds up. Um, and that can be a difference of, you know, 500 calories easily. And I gave this example before, but even in our own homes, we are uh, subject to portion distortion. Um, and another little anecdotal, you know, story that I have, but I think it, it demonstrates this. Um, several years ago, when, when I when I first got married, my husband has a huge family. He's got like 30 first cousins. We were hosting uh, Christmas for the first time. And um, of course I panicked like the, the day before and, and you know, uh, was afraid that I didn't have enough of certain things. And so I ran out to this to Target um, <clears throat> to grab some additional like serving plates, serving platters, just to put out extra things, you know, around, around the house. Um, and so um, I grabbed a few uh, like Christmas themed, you know, uh, like plastic, like serving, serving pl uh, you know, plates, platters. And I went up to the checkout and I was like, wow, these are really inexpensive. They're like 99 cents or something. And I'm like, you know, surprised that they were, you know, that that inexpensive. Um, and I got home and then I was taking off the price tag and I noticed that they were labeled as dinner plates. When I was looking at them and they looked huge, big enough to me to be more of like a serving serving plate or serving platter, um, but they were labeled as dinner plates. And, and um, that just uh, struck me as an interesting example of where we're seeing portion distortion in these, you know, much bigger plates than what used to be available. And again, this is the norm. We have been, it, it's distorted so now so that we, we expect these much larger plates. In fast food, so fast food restaurants offer bigger portions at a marginal cost. And this is constantly being marketed to us, right? Supersizing, competition is fierce nowadays to increase revenue. There really is a limit to how much a person can eat. And so restaurants are constantly competing for that. They want to be the one that you choose because once you choose one place, you're not going to go um, and eat again at a different place. Usually, you know, you've, you've chosen that one place for your meal and that's it. Um, so they're competing for that attention and that business so that you go um, to eat with them. Um, and with fast food, they also understand that lack of planning and time makes it an easy substitute um, than, you know, healthier cooking at home, which takes time and planning. Okay. Would you like to supersize that? Um, you know, it, it, supersizing is um, something that's very common now. And in some cases, it has increased the, the serving sizes, the portion sizes um, to more than double. I mean, those gigantic drinks that we have now, they don't even fit in like the cup holders that, you know, <laughs> we have in our, in our cars. Um, so we're seeing this with the food, with the drinks, well, pretty much everywhere. And this was just a honey curve tooth strip that I found. Welcome to, you know, to McDonald's. We're reducing trans fatty acids in our fries and reducing the saturated fat because we're committed to helping you eat healthier. So then the guy says, an order of fries, please. And then they say, would you like to supersize that? <laughs> um, so how committed are they really to, uh, to this idea, right? <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, so this, this was a study that I found interesting when it comes to um, portion distortion and, and our eating and health behaviors. Pardon me while I just hydrate a little bit. So there's a study that was done at Cornell um, where they served popcorn, free popcorn to moviegoers. This is uh, at a movie theater in, uh, in Philadelphia. So when they gave people this free popcorn, half the people that um, were going to the movie got freshly made popcorn. The other half got 14 day old stale popcorn. Okay, um, They were served in two uh, sizes. Um, so some people got fresh popcorn in a medium size, some got a large, some got the stale popcorn in a medium, and some got it in a large. Um, I don't know if you've ever eaten stale popcorn, but it's like, it's, it's, it, to me, it's, it's yucky, right? It's like chewy. It's hard to, hard to chew, hard to swallow. It's like, yeah, um, doesn't, it's not, not appealing. Um, but interestingly enough, those that got fresh popcorn ate 43 and a half percent more when given the large container. But those that got the stale popcorn, the stuff that I think is is uh, is kind of gross, <laughs> still ate 34% more when given a large container. So when food is there, we eat it, is basically you know, what, what this is saying. Um, so it didn't deter people from eating larger portions, even when the product was not fresh and didn't taste good. Um, and we see this, and this is one example, you know, it, it, it illustrates the point that um, when food is there, we just tend to eat it. 
So when we're served larger portion sizes, we just eat it, even if we're not hungry, usually, you know, and we, we I mean, everybody, everybody does this to some degree, how, uh, you know, if you've ever been at a restaurant and you're done with your meal um, and you're sitting there and you're full, um, but there's still some fries left on your plate and they're sitting in front of you, the server hasn't come to clear the plates yet. So you're just eating because they're there, right? So it's sort of like a, a way, uh, it's a, a type of um, what we call mindless eating. You're not eating because you're hungry or, um, you know, or any other reason than just you're there and there's food available. And so you're eating. So this, this study just demonstrates that that is our tendency. When there is food available, we eat it. So when our portions are larger and there's more quantity of food available, we tend to eat it. All right. So how to measure portions accurately. So we, you know, we know that serving sizes are what's on the uh, nutrition facts label. So how can we make our portion sizes closer to serving sizes? This may seem self-explanatory, but um, also I don't know how many of us are actually in the habit of using measuring tools like measuring cups, spoons, scales, you know, kitchen scales. Um, when you're making a recipe, do you actually use the, um, you know, if you're cooking dinner or something, do you actually uh, follow the recipe and measure things out, or are you just eyeballing it? Sometimes when we eyeball, we tend to grossly underestimate the amount that we're using. So for example, say of butter or you know oils or something else. So if you actually take the time to measure things out, it can be a little bit eye-opening to understand how much you are actually making or eating. Also using food labels to make your portions more closely resemble the serving sizes. So um, in the, the one picture that I showed at the beginning of the cereal in the bowls, um, now remember our bowls are bigger than they ever used to be, right? Because that's just what is available now and what is made and what's normal. Um, if you ever put the actual serving size that a cereal you know, has listed on the nutrition facts label into a large bowl like that, you might say, well, that doesn't look right, but it actually may be more reflective of the serving size. So if you put you know, three quarters of a cup of cereal in this gigantic cereal bowl, that maybe holds like three cups, it might look a little sad. So um, <clears throat> that's why we tend to have this issue of portion distortion because we tend to fill up the bowl or plate that we're using. So using measuring tools can help you to ensure that the um, portion that you're serving yourself more accurately reflects the serving size on the nutrition facts label. Um, this is um, a little, you know, handy, dan no, no pun intended, but handy guide to um, portion control. Um, you can use your hand to kind of estimate the uh, serving sizes for various foods. So, um, and I, I'm, I can email this out to uh, Kendra and hopefully she can email this out to everybody who registered for today so that you can have this um, on hand to, um, to refer to. Um, so if you don't have measuring tools on hand, um, you can actually just use, use your own hand to kind of guesstimate the uh, serving size or portion sizes of things. So your fingertip is about a teaspoon. Okay, um, about how much butter you might use for one serving. Your thumb from knuckle to tip is about a tablespoon. That's your, your other knuckle there, a little bigger for that. So that would be about a serving size of peanut butter. Um, a clenched fist is roughly one cup. I know everybody's, you know, hands are different sizes. So this is again, a rough guesstimation, but um, it helps to guide you to some degree. So that's about a cup. Um, serving size of meat is three ounces which again may sound small because we are used to much bigger portions now. That's at roughly the size of your palm. Um, <clears throat> pasta, a half a cup is one serving or about um, the front of your, your clenched fist here. So I can email this out so you have it handy. That makes things easier. So I've been referring to the um, nutrition facts label. So here is an example of a nutrition facts label where we're going to look at um, the serving size, okay? Um, so it's, it's listed at the top. Usually it's, it's the, the, one of the very first things that you see on the nutrition facts label. Um, so here it says serving size, one cup, which was under four, three quarters of a cup, right? Because kids, um, smaller tummies, smaller bodies don't need quite as much. Um, servings per container, about 14. So again, if you put one cup of cereal into a very large cereal bowl, which is now, again, pretty much the norm, what we're used to seeing, what we probably have in our homes, um, it might be less than you're used to eating. Um, one solution to this is to buy smaller bowls. I actually did that a few years ago, um, largely because, uh, well, this is what I do, right? So I'm aware of the, the, the phenomenon of portion distortion, um, but also our, I have three kids. So our kids, 
And my husband was filling up the cereal bowl in the morning to like the top and they weren't eating like half of it. And I kept telling him like, just give them less, give them less. And he just couldn't like, it was, it, I see this playing out in my own home, right? Where we have the bowl. So you fill it up to the size that it is. Um, instead of just putting less, you can always take more if you need it. You can't take it out and put it back in the box once, once you've poured milk on it and started eating it. Right. So I always try to tell him this and he just, he just couldn't. So I just bought smaller bowls and we've been wasting a lot less food since then. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see that serving size right at the top. Um, and then the calories that are there, of course, are for one serving. So if you have a serving size, one cup, let's say your portion though is two cups, then you have to double everything else too. So that'll be double the calories. So that'll be 200 calories instead of uh, the 100. The fat will increase from two grams to four grams um, and, uh, and so on down. Okay, um, so just keep that in mind that the serving, the, the calories and all the nutrients that are listed on the nutrition facts label are for one serving of that food. So if you were trying to get your calories down to, uh, you know, the, the, um, what is on the nutrition facts label to make sure that your um, servings actually reflect the serving size on the nutrition facts label. I am going to uh, just do a quick plug for my plate. Um, I'm guessing uh, most, if not all of you are familiar with this, um, but it, uh, it you know, never hurts to kind of get a little refresher. So this is my plate. This is from the USDA, US Department of Agriculture. Um, this is what, um, you know, they publish as their go-to graphic for ensuring that people um, have something to refer to if they're trying to eat a balanced diet. When I was growing up, we had the, my, uh, sorry, the, the food pyramid. I remember my first or second grade teacher and putting it on the on the board and at the bottom was grains and then I forget how how um, the exact uh, stripes went. Um, but that is now obsolete. They have now updated it to my plate. I think this is actually um, an improvement. Um, we don't eat off pyramids, we eat off plates. So this is a nice visual that we can understand what should a, my ideal you know balanced meal look like. It doesn't mean that every single meal you eat will look like this. But when you're looking over the course of a day or a week, you want to try to balance out your food intake so that you're um, getting um, foods from all of these food groups, um, fruits, vegetables, grains, and protein. You'll notice that fruits and vegetables should take, make up about half of what you eat, um, and a protein should be about a quarter. Um, this is not how Americans tend to eat. We tend to not eat enough fruits and vegetables or whole grains, um, but this is here to, to show you the proportion of foods that you ideally would be eating to maintain a balanced diet and make sure that you are getting all the nutrients that you need. More about managing portion sizes. So again, using smaller plates and bowls. Um, psychologically, again, we fill up our bowl or plate, whatever's in front of us. So if you use a smaller one, um, you will just fill that up and, um, you know, you can always go back for more, but like I said, well, you can't really put it back once it's on your plate. So check the food labels for the serving size. Try to make sure that your portion sizes actually reflect what the serving size is on the nutrition facts label. Use smaller packages of candy, popcorn, snacks. If you are grabbing a snack to go, let's say you're getting in the car and you, you, you want to grab a snack to go, you're, you know, you're rushing around, um, busy lifestyle. I know we are, we're always bringing our kids somewhere to go to some activity or sport or something. And we often bring snacks with us just to, you know, save time. Um, so instead of like grabbing the whole bag, maybe put something in a, a you know, a baggie or, you know, a, a Tupperware container or something to bring with you um, so that um, you just have that one smaller portion. You can also buy, they have those um, smaller packs, like the single serving packs. Because um, again, remember, if you have the, the whole bag in front of you of the pretzels or snack, whatever it is, um, we saw from the Cornell popcorn study that we are more likely to eat more simply if it's present. Okay, portion controlled packages reduce temptation to eat more. Um, move more. Okay, exercise does balance out our um, calorie intake. Um, so if you are, you know, eat, on, on, you're trying to balance out your uh, food intake, um, getting more exercise will help you balance that out. Um, if this is something that is new to you, if you're someone who is new to exercise and it's unfamiliar for you, you can start out small. It doesn't, I'm not saying here that everybody has to be a, you know, a marathon runner, um, but uh, being sure to incorporate a 15 or 20 minute walk in a day. The CDC recommends 150 minutes of moderate to intense physical activity per week to maintain a healthy heart. Um, and so that can include brisk walking. 
It can include yoga. It can include gardening. Uh, you know, just moving with intention um, to get that heart pumping and to um, you know uh, get those calories going. Okay. So we are. Oh, I must have talked fast. So um, we are at eleven thirty-seven. Um, that's what I have to present to you today. Um, we do have plenty of time for questions and answers. I also ask that um, everyone who is attending today, please to fill out an, an evaluation of today's session. Uh, there's a QR code that you can use to scan um, with your phone. I will also drop um, a link to um, this, the evaluation um, in the, the chat box in a moment so that you can just click on that and go right to um, the evaluation that way. Um, these evaluations help Rutgers to understand what audiences we're reaching and um, also helps us to know if there is anything we could change or improve about our programming. The, um, the evaluations are anonymous, um, so you don't have to put any identifying information. And if there's any questions that you would rather not answer, there's always an option for prefer not to respond. So you can always choose that option. Um, <clears throat> these evaluations are um, sent to Rutgers and then they're summarized and sent back to me. Um, I read them and um, I value them. And I have absolutely made changes to my programming in the past based on feedback that I have gotten from these evaluations. So I really, really would uh, deeply appreciate it if you could take the two to three minutes that it takes to complete the survey, complete the evaluation. Um, it would, uh, would help me out a lot and help Rutgers as well. And so while you are doing that, I am also going to get the link in the chat box here. I'll leave. Okay, I just put it in there. So hopefully you can just open the chat and click on it and then it should bring up the, um, the, uh, the survey for you. Okay, and so now I um, am happy to take any questions that anyone may have and I will just leave that up. So in case people wanna scan it with their phones. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I just, let me just double check here. Um, it's saying the chat is disabled. Um, oh. Let me yeah. see why that's happening. All right. If, um, let me see. I can quick. I can put the the link. You know, in. And I also I also was told that the the QR code isn't working. Is it still not working? Someone can just message, add that to the the uh, the, the question box. If you're oh. unable to. I don't know why that's happening. Hmm. Okay. Let me see if I can figure out why. And then, and, you know, also I can always send a link at the very end of the um, webinar. I'll send an email out to everyone who registered today. Okay. And, uh, uh, okay. They said they were able to, yeah, it, it worked. The okay. QR code okay. is working, but I just checked it before we, <laughs> this morning. no worries. Um, no worries. And again, I always end up sending out, um, a, a follow-up email so I could I'll just do that at the very end just to make sure everyone have the opportunity to fill out this evaluation okay that'd be great thank you so much mm -hmm. there's the QR code if anyone does want the link I can always advance I just dropped it in I know it's long so it's hard to type in but you can always also um uh check your email for that or use the QR code okay, great all right Jennifer thank you so much for a wonderful um presentation I mean this is I'm sure you know it's in, it will benefit each and every one of us um I know it helped me a lot because I tend to struggle a little bit with, you know, my portion and controlling that. So um, we do have a few questions. Um, so first, um, one person mentioned, um, actually, I'm seeing a shrinkage in the size of products at the grocery store, but the cost the same example. Ice cream is no longer half a gallon and same for chips. Oh, yeah. So so inflation actually may have had an effect on portion. Uh, um sizes now, which is an interesting side effect of, of inflation. Um, but yeah, we're used to getting these gigantic portions at very low prices. So <clears throat> um, that is an interesting observation. And I don't know of any studies that have come out on this, but um, it, it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, um, you're right that sometimes companies do try to shrink their products a little bit, like not to a very noticeable degree, but still charge the same amount. 
right? Mm -hmm. um, so for single serving portions, you know, that may be somewhat of a, an, an antidote to some degree for portion distortion. Um, but when we're buying the the larger, you know, more than single serving packages of certain foods, like ice cream, for example, still might not affect how much we actually put in our bowls or actually eat, right? Thank you. Sure. Um, can you speak on how intuitive eating plays into portioning out your food? So balancing out measuring food and trying to go with serving sizes, but also learning to listen to your body. Um, yeah, so intuitive eating is probably another whole it's another, you know, hour webinar that I could talk on. So I'll try to just give a very brief response to that. Um, intuitive eating is basically learning to listen to your body and um, eating what you, you know, the signals that your body is telling you, right? Eating according to those. So stopping when you're full. Um, I, so portion distortion, I think, has... Um, again, distorted our understanding of what it means to be full. And this was an interesting thing. I, I read this um, a, a while back that in um, other countries, when you're eating, the question isn't, are you full? It's, oh, are you still hungry? Um, which I think it's a subtle difference, but I think there is a difference. So that feeling of being really, really full, which is usually the result of um, probably eating a little more than our bodies need, is what we have become used to. And so it may, if that is what we are used to, it may take longer to incorporate intuitive eating if that's the feeling that you're looking for, that we're used to. Um, so intuitive eating um, is something that um, may not come very easily to a lot of people and may take a while to, um, to get used to and understand the signals that our bodies are giving to us. I hope I answered that question. I'm not sure if, uh, if, if feel free to put a, put a follow-up question if, if there was anything that uh, I didn't address in that answer. Great, thank you. Oh. Uh, regarding the USDA plate, what about the common perception that as it's publicized by the USDA and not the CDC or even the DHHS. It is unduly influenced by the agriculture. Is it unduly influenced by the agri agriculture industry? What is the response? Um, well, at the USDA, they do have, you know, there's the, the people who work at the USDA who are doctors and dietitians and, you know, their primary um, disciplines are health and nutrition. So that's the the um, portion of the, the USDA that develops this these kinds of things when it, when it comes to nutrition and, and food. Okay. I know some of you asked about the slides. I did include it in the chat box, but what I'll do at the very end of the webinar is I'll send the slides out to those who attended the webinar today um, to make sure that you have that. Um, we would love to hear you, your take on popular diet trends and example keto. Do you think these also encourage or discourage portion distortion? Um, so um, again, I could, I have another whole webinar on fad diets. So that's another topic that I could talk about at length, but I'll try to give a brief answer. Um, so um, yeah, fad diets um, often are not based on, you know, sound science and um, sound research. So keto diet, for example, is, is an example of that. Um, it is very popular right now. Um, and um, there's a lot of, there's a lot that's been published on the keto diet that sounds very scientific and sounds like it is based in uh, research and science, um, but uh, but really is not. Um, the keto diet was developed 100 years ago um, for uh, to be studied on the for its effects on epilepsy. Um, somehow, it um, became popular again more recently as a general you know uh, method for um, health maintenance and weight loss. Um, but, um, there's, there's really no evidence that it is something that is maintainable for the long term for, for good health. Um, so when it comes to portion distortion, yeah, I mean, um, keto diet and other diets that, you know, that emphasize eating one food group much more than others, um, can definitely have a, an effect on portion distortion because, you know, you're given this idea that, um, and I, actually I was giving a talk yesterday at the library and I was talking about the Mediterranean diet. And there's a woman in the audience who very proudly was like, well, I read a book that said that you shouldn't eat grains. And so I no longer eat any grains. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, I get this a lot where I you have to be careful. There are a lot of nutrients that we get from grains um, that, um, you know, our bodies can benefit from. And um, any diet that you look at that completely eliminates or really severely overemphasizes one food group, um, I would always, you know, be wary of and suspicious of because it means that you're cutting out a whole food group that may have essential nutrients that your body is not getting. Thank you for that. Um, how do you motivate uh, people to adopt this in their daily lives? Oh, well, if I had the answer to that, I don't know. I might be paid at a much higher pay scale than I am. <laughs> um, it's it's tricky. I mean, it, you know, the motivation is um, is something that, um, as I said before, we are we have a much we are much greater. Sorry, we are much. Um, more significantly influenced by our surroundings, by our environment, when it comes to the way we behave um, in terms of health than anything else. So, um, and this is why portion distortion has become such a widespread issue because we are you know, surrounded by all these um, you know, big portions everywhere that we look. So it has now, it now feels normal to us. Um, so um, as far as motivation, I mean, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a life coach or a health coach, I'm here to give information. So as far as the motivation, I hope that some of the statistics that I give about how some of these health trends affects our individual health is motivation, but sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes it isn't. You know, we're living in an environment that does not encourage mm -hmm. health habits. So, and we're all subject to that, all of us. Okay. Um, how, do you, how do you train your body to eat less if you don't feel full? Um... Again, this this is a uh, going into like intuitive eating, and um, I, I I don't know anything about the person who's answering who's asking this question, and so it's hard for me to answer these sometimes, you know, not knowing anything about the person. Um, but um, yeah, it does take some getting used to, especially you know, part of a, a side effect of portion distortion is that we are so used to um, just being really really full after eating, um, and so that is what we're used to, and that's what feels normal. Um, so I, it takes a little bit of experimentation, maybe, you know, if you're not eating enough protein that, you know, you might not feel full for very long. Um, fat is also important when it comes to satiety, not overdoing it on the fat, but ensuring that you're getting some fat in your diet. Um, I know that some people, when they, um, try to go on, you know, do some kind of weight loss, um, they tend to cut out, uh, um, a lot of fat, which is in general, a good approach, but if you cut out too much, you might feel yourself, you know, getting hungry too quickly. So, so it, it takes a little trial and error, um, to understand, you know, what works for you as far as keeping you full. Mm -hmm. keeping Great. You. Um, what is the best way to describe to someone who has a low health literacy, um, how they should approach depicting portions and servings? Can you repeat that? Sorry. Yes. What is the best way to describe to someone who has a low health literacy and how they should approach um, depicting portions and servings? Yeah. Um, so hopefully, you know, that that um, the graphic that I showed you with the hand can be helpful. I mean, that's something that you don't know how to you have to know how to read to understand that, you know, your palm is a serving of meat. Right. Or your fingertip is a serving of butter. Your your thumb tip is a serving of, of a, is a tablespoon or a serving of peanut butter. Um, so graphics like that, I think are very helpful. I think even the my plate graphic, just understanding the proportions of foods that we should be eating, you know, it's colorful. Um, and, um, so if you can, you know, understand that the, the blue is for dairy and the, the green is for vegetables, um, someone with a low rate of literacy, um, can also, you know, understand those colors and what they mean as far as the, the different types of food they should be eating as well. Mm -hmm. um, is there a movement in regards to possibly regulating portion control with the fast food chains? No. <laughs> um, I don't see that happening. They have, um, they, they don't, they're not motivated to, you know, they, they, I don't see that happening anytime soon, really. They have a, a, um, a lot of, you know, influence and motivation to continue what they're doing. Um, we have someone asking, do you give presentations to the community? And if so, how do you get good participation? All the time. Yes. In fact, I mentioned just a few minutes ago that I was uh, giving a presentation yesterday on the Mediterranean diet at a library. And um, so how do I get good participation? Well, to a large degree, I depend on the, the partner that I'm um, um, working with. So if I'm working with a library, the library promotes the program. 
Um, and um, I hope for the best. Sometimes I go and there's 30 people and sometimes I go and there's two people. But even if there's two people that it's getting in the information, that's more than we had before. So um, yeah. That's great. Um, how can people who live in a food desert apply this knowledge? I know they have limited options of healthier foods that's causing food por um, portion issues. Again, I wish I had a great silver bullet answer to that question. Um, yeah, if you're living in a food desert and you are trying to just make sure that you have enough food and that it's available to you, this is a really, really hard thing to address, right? Because when you go to the store, you're not going to buy perishable foods if you know you're not going to be able to get to the store again for another two weeks or three weeks or whatever. Um, so that means that maybe you're buying uh, more packaged items, which is a smart economic approach, right? Um, so again, I don't really have a great answer. And this, but, but, but this just illustrates why things like portion distortion and our environment has such a great influence on our health behaviors. It's not, it's very often not an individual choice and you only have a certain amount of uh, control over your own situation if, if your environment dictates to a large extent, you know, what you're able to do. Um, culturally, I was taught to clean my plate so as not to be, as not to be wasteful. It has been a difficult habit to break as an adult. Can you speak to how you address portion distortion with parents who grew up in a household with similar clean plate, plate cultures, but want to make changes to their children? for their children, sorry. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked this question. I also grew up in the same type of household. My grandma was from a very poor area of Eastern Europe. And she came from an environment where she literally didn't know where her next meal was going to come from or when she was going to get it or if she was going to get it. Food was extremely precious and valuable. Of course it is if you don't know if you're going to be able to eat again or when that will happen. Um, and so I think this idea of not wasting food, and it's, Kendra, I don't know if anybody um, remembers from your introduction of me at the beginning of the webinar, but food waste is actually an area that I am working in right now. So preventing food waste, um, specifically in institutions like schools, um, and uh, uh, teaching kids why, why it's such a problem. Um, and so um, this is a problem, it's a struggle that um, I have personally, because I don't, I, I hate seeing food wasted. It's something that I grew up with and something that I now have kind of come full circle and I'm working on again. Um, I think that um, there's a few things you can do and if nothing's gonna be a hundred percent, I mean, um, if we are trying to teach kids to eat intuitively and to listen to their bodies, um, then we say, when you're not hungry anymore, you don't eat anymore, you know, and, and, and that's okay. But then sometimes there's a lot of food left on their plate. So, um, Small things that you can do, uh, serve meals family style whenever possible and teach kids to serve themselves a little bit at a time. Take one spoonful of noodles. If you want more, you can always take it. Again, you can't really put it back once you've put it on your plate. You can always take more. And just in, in, instilling that habit in kids to only take a little bit at a time so that um, it doesn't go to waste. Okay. Um, I think it is important to listen to kids when they say that they've had enough. Um, it instills trust in the feet. And this is, again, I have a whole webinar that I have given to many, many parents on um, how to instill healthy eating habits in kids. And this is something that I talk about in that webinar. So I'll try to keep it brief. Um, but um, just establishing that trust in the feeding relationship is really important. So you want to listen to kids when they say, I'm good, I've had enough. Um, and, you know, cleaning your plate can encourage overeating and um, can you know, actually instill um, unhealthy eating behaviors in kids um, for the long term. So, um, so yeah, uh, doing family style um, helps. I mean, just have trying to have foods that are um, easily reheated so you can have leftovers, put them in your fridge and reheat for later. Some for some foods that works better than others, you know, maybe like if you're serving fish, it might not work so well, you know, uh, maybe for more than a day or two. Um, but with uh, other foods, you know, you can easily reheat them for later. So trying to be conscientious of that um, and understanding that there will be some some waste if you're working, if you have kids. I have three kids and I, you know, so I'm, I'm there with the people who are struggling with this issue as well. That's great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, just keeping track of time. Is there a discussion about why we may increase our portions and eat more than what is recommended? It does not seem so clear cut as, as there is more food and larger dishes and that's why we do it. 
whether that's eating that whether that's eating disorders, depression, pandemic related issues, etc. Eating disorder prevalence has increased since the pandemic. Yeah. So um, the, so the question in there was, if you I think it came at the beginning, and I mm -hmm. is there a discussion about why we may increase our portions and eat more than what is recommended, and more than what is recommended? Um. Well, yeah. I mean, to to some degree, I did address that in some of the the earlier slides. Um. A lot of it is industry driven. Um. And food producers, whether it's restaurants or um, you know, food producers that that uh, uh, distribute food to a grocery store or others. Um, are competing for a business and they know that um, if you get more value for your dollar, you're more likely to buy their product. And so a lot of it comes from that. Okay. Um, I'm gonna see, let me see if there's one more question I can take here, this being considered of everyone's time. Um, I noticed that people commit on, my, on smaller portion amounts on my plate, sometimes making me feel too different. How do I respond to this in a healthy way? I'm not sure I understand. So, I'm sorry to make you repeat everything, but can you just say that again? No, it's okay. I noticed that people commit on my smaller portion amounts on my on my plate. Oh. Um, sometimes making me feel too different. How do I respond to this in a healthy way? Okay, so they they comment like they make comments on that you're not eating enough. I guess I that's the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I would just say um, I'm eating what you know what I feel like I need to eat, and I'm not hungry. I mean, you know. There's no, uh, I hope there's, it's not getting to the point where they're shaming you for not eating enough. But I think that's not, that's not uncommon, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like my grandma used to do to us, we were not allowed to get up the table for, for the table for any reason, any reason until our plates were clean. Um, so we are, a lot of us come from this culture because maybe we're coming from families that came from situations where, you know, that um, food was uh, uh, not as plentiful as it is today. So you didn't waste it for any, for any reason under any circumstances. So that's just sort of like a, a, a norm that we're, a lot of us are used to. Um, but I think maybe you have a chance to break that norm and say, no, you know, this is enough for me. I'm good. Thank you. And then change the topic. <laughs> Don't let it get to you. <laughs> okay. So I know we are close to time. I know two people had their hand raised. Um, if you have questions, um, please feel free uh, to email me. I, again, I am going to resend um, the evaluation link. There is an evaluation for this webinar, um, so please look out for that. Um, if you didn't, receive, if you don't end up getting it, you know, please send me an email, and I could, I, you know, of course, again, it will be sent out. Um, and I share my email too if people have follow up questions. Yes, yes, we have. We did have a few more questions, um, so I was going to go through that. But yes, if you do have additional questions um that, that I can definitely share uh Jennifer's um email as well but, so Jennifer thank you so much for a wonderful um presentation um we definitely need to know this information and it's the holidays right um this give us a, a, an even more bigger reason to eat more I know for me it does <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. um thank you so much for having me I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this uh topic to um a population, you know, to, to a group of people that has, um, you know, maybe some influence over people's health behavior. So I hope that it was useful for you. And I appreciate you being here and um, feel free to um, email me with any additional questions that you may have. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you. Take care.